So, uh, so well, this is the title of my talk, um, and you can probably tell from the way the title is constructed that the talk actually has two pieces to it. Uh, the, what's the first piece is uh, about the simulation of uh, high temperature superconductors, so beyond the typical models that one uses, so truly ab initio simulations. That's really the main part of the talk. I'll try and present this at a somewhat high level since it's a pretty diverse crowd here, I think. Uh, and then, in the end, I'm just going to finish off with a few slides, which are just some thoughts and some questions on what is actually the title of this workshop, which is all about model reductions. Okay, um, so let's just start uh, with uh, defining what these materials are. I'll tell you a little bit about these materials. Okay, so high temperature superconductors are materials which uh, superconduct, they carry current with no resistance, uh, up to a relatively high temperature, a very too high critical temperature, usually called TC. Um, and uh, materials uh, with these properties were discovered uh, more than 30 years ago. So, you know, in, in the 80s, uh, there were the cuprates, and these con uh, are superconducting up to about 100 Kelvin. This is all ambient pressure. So if you go into very, the very high pressure regime, you can find other materials which superconduct at high temperatures. But, uh, but at ambient pressure, these are the, uh, these are the uh, main ones. Um, and then, you know, in, in, the, in the 2000s, uh, some iron, an iron-based family of materials were discovered as well. Um, so they're very, very interesting for a number of reasons. And so sociologically, they're also interesting because they were, they're the subject of a lot of activity. So if by some estimates, you know, more than 100,000 papers were published. And this was already 10 years ago. So this number uh, has since grown. Um, but despite this very large amount of work, um, we still don't really have the ability to predict what kinds of materials are high temperature superconductors. And even within a given family of materials, so if you were to take just say the cuprates, we don't really understand why one cuprate has a higher transition temperature uh, than another. Um, now, the uh, reason for this, you know, this problem, the fact that we don't know so much, is not because we, we don't understand how superconductivity works. Uh, we do generally understand the basic idea behind superconductivity, and we have done for a very long time. Um, superconductivity as a bulk phenomenon arises when there are effective attractions between uh, the electrons. Um, and this may seem a little bit unusual because electrons, of course, have negative charge, so why are they attracting? Um, but the key point here is this is an effective attraction, um, and this can arise when the electrons are embedded in some kind of medium. You know, they're put in the presence of other particles. Um, an example for how such an effective attraction might arise is, uh, is the mechanism which is usually invoked in what we call traditional low temperature superconductors. Um, so in this case, the, uh, the effective medium is the lattice of the crystal, the other nuclei or the ions. Um, and one can certainly imagine some process by which um, the distortion of the lattice by an electron is correlated with the distortions of, other, of the lattice by other electrons. In particular, if an electron sort of gets near to some part of the lattice and distorts it, you can sort of picture that there's a locally higher positive charge, and so another electron might be encouraged to be distorting the lattice in a similar place, inducing an effective attraction. Um, so this picture all works very well, and uh, it can generate an effective attraction, uh, but it's, it's a very weak attraction, um, and so it doesn't sort of survive thermal fluctuations you know, beyond a very low temperature. Um, and so that's the uh, basic problem with uh, the high temperature superconducting materials. Um, although we know there should be some kind of effective attraction generating this phenomenon, it's clear that at least this type of electron phonon or electron vibration coupling can't be the whole story because it is in general very weak. Um, and so another type of glue is needed and what that kind of glue is, is uh, unclear. Um, now we can have some maybe guess for what might be generating this effect of attraction by looking at the general properties of the materials. Um, and so as it turns out, if you look at the cuprate family materials, the, the phase diagram is quite well conserved across the different types of cuprates. Um, and so this is a picture of the phase diagram. It's the phase diagram just means there are some axes, which are so parameters of the material. Here it is temperature, and this is the doping of the material. And then you, you indicate on the diagram you know, what, what uh, bulk phenomenon you see at different points. Again, that's a phase diagram. Um, 
Most of the time in this talk, in fact, all the time in this particular talk, I'll be working at zero temperature, okay? So we're gonna be on the bottom axis. Um, now, now, the cuprates, when, when you take the clean material, the pure material, they, they are not superconducting at all. They're just magnetic insulators, they, what we call antiferromagnets, and that's indicated by this little phase here. Um, and then when you dope them sufficiently, so you in inject some charges into them in some way, uh, then they become superconducting. Now, the, the proximity of the superconducting behavior to this type of antiferromagnetic behavior, which is present in all these compounds, suggests that perhaps the magnetism has something to do with the superconductivity. And indeed, one can create some kind of cartoon picture of how that might arise. So the parent compound, before you dope it, is an antiferromagnet. That just means if you take the magnetic moments on the individual atoms, they make a nice checkerboard pattern, up, down, up, down, up, down. This is stabilized by the exchange interactions, the Heisenberg exchange interactions between the atoms. Um, and now imagine doping it, so putting some charges in. So, so when you put the charges in, you remove the moment, because the charges, these electrons are, for example, char carrying the moment. So let's put some, let's take some electrons out, put some positive charges in. Um, and you, so you induce some holes. Um, and it's clear that when you introduce some holes, you break this antiferromagnetic background. Um, and then, you know, just in the same way that when you put oil in water, you know, they kind of, the, 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 this is sort of different. You've broken up some favorable set of interactions. You know, it's, it's natural to want to place those things closer together okay, to minimize the surface area so, so that they don't break so many of these favorable antiferromagnetic exchange interactions. So that's sort of a cartoon, and it indicates you know, some idea of where some pairing might come from, but that's really all it is. It's just a cartoon. Um, it's not a quantitative theory, uh, and in fact, it's not the only way in which you can imagine pairing arising. So this is just one of the many, many proposed mechanisms. Can you briefly explain what is pseudo gap? Well, that's a very deep question. Uh, okay, well, there are some uh, so there are some things in between here and here where we don't fully understand the properties in this, in this system. Um, but it, if you look at the uh, photoelectron spectrum, there are some, some things which look a little bit like the superconducting gap, but it hasn't actually made the whole superconducting gap yet, so we call that the pseudo gap. Yeah. But that's very sort of mysterious what's going on here. Yeah. My question is, I mean, in the, in the usual conventional superconductors, the pairs are uh, of opposite momentum. Yes. So they're not localized in space. And yes. your, your cartoon, however, suggests that the pairs here are really, uh, you know, on, on next, next sides to each other. Yeah, so uh, that's right. So in conventional superconductors, the, the so pairing is expected to occur over very long distances. Um, I mean, the indications are that in these materials, they're, they are smaller, the pairs are much smaller. I'm sure they're not as small as this. This is just an indication of some way in which uh, attraction is generated. It's not an indication of what the quantum state actually is. The quantum state could be much larger, um, but it is considered likely that they're much smaller than in, the, that, that, than in say, like uh, aluminum or lead. Okay. So, um, so, okay, so this is just, you know, as I say, it's a cartoon, it's just one of many cartoons one can draw. Okay, so, so this is, you know, my training is in quantum chemistry, and so this is kind of where I think uh, quantum chemistry comes into this picture, because it's a sort of general feature of all complex phenomena, in fact, um, that there are many mechanisms to generate the physics. Um, and, and this means that, you know, trying to understand the problem, not just at the cartoon level, or, or, or in, in fact, in very simple analytic models, uh, uh, is important. Very, very detailed quantitative and numerical theories are crucial, and quantitative, so many body calculations of, um, <clears throat> of chemicals and materials are what quantum chemists generally do. Um, and so essentially, you know, in, all you have to do, so to speak, is solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So you have to solve for the eigenstates of the electronic Hamiltonian, and somehow all this physics should just arise. Um, uh, but in practice, doing so requires uh, doing it very well, okay, because these phenomena occur at fairly small energy scales. And so, um, and so what one has to do uh, from a quantum chemistry perspective is you have to achieve very good convergence with respect to many different axes of the problem. Two of these axes are familiar from molecular problems, so 
on, so for example, the basis representation, you have to go towards a basis set limit, and you have to treat the interactions very accurately. This is the electron correlation. Um, and a new feature of when it's used to molecular problems is that you also have to go to the thermodynamic limit because phases are thermodynamic properties. They don't sort of occur in very small molecules. Okay, so in some sense, we just have to push as far as we can on these three axes. But if we can do so, then we have a hope, perhaps, of identifying the correct origin of physics. And then we can also understand questions that are more detailed in nature, for example, quantitative predictions of the superconducting temperature and we uh, can even perhaps connect the physics to the chemistry, so we can connect the composition and structure to the properties. Okay, so that's sort of the sort of motivation for what we're going to try and uh, do in this talk. Okay, so the first thing that we need is some uh, computational model to uh, generate um, the types of phenomena that we're interested in. In this case, it's going to be superconductivity. Um, and there's a variety of ways that you could do, you could do this, a variety of mathematical formalisms, um, but one wants one that is sort of simple enough that, that eventually we can extend this to a full quantum chemistry calculation with all the detailed interactions and all the atoms and so on and so forth. Um, and so we're first going to examine what's a very, very simple way in which you can achieve a description of phases. Um, so the simplest way to think about phases occurring is that they arise essentially from uh, different minima in some nonlinear non energy function. Um, so if you take a traditional statistical mechanics theory of phases, you have your free energy function as a function of the order parameter. When you minimize it, you find there's various minima, and those are the phases. Okay? So the so same thing is true for electronic phases. Um, and so you can imagine that you have some electronic state, and it depends on some parameters, and it has some nonlinear dependence, and some, when you minimize this, there may be uh, multiple solutions, and those you might identify with phases. Um, now the simplest example of this type of nonlinear energy theory would be molecular orbital theory, you know, Hartree-Fock theory. Um, and there, the parameters are the orbitals, and this minimization is just optimized in respect to the orbitals. And this is all nonlinear because the orbital depends on the potential that it lives in, the potential depends on the orbital, and so on and so forth. Okay. So when carrying out this minimization, um, you can get multiple solutions. And, for example, if you just have, say, one minimum, you might just say, well, you're in some regime of the material structure where you just have one phase, perhaps a non-magnetic phase, but, you know, you can have, for example, different solutions, magnetic, non-magnetic, and perhaps superconducting. Now, the problem with this very simple nonlinear theory, however, is there's a no-go theorem that was established by Lee uh, many years ago, which tells you that if you take just the Coulomb interactions, so if you just take the ordinary electronic structure problem and the electrons are just interacting with them via the Coulomb interaction, uh, then you can, in fact, never find a superconducting solution. Okay, so, so this means that this is not a right candidate for, um, for generating superconducting phases. So one wants to have a slightly more complicated nonlinear energy function. Um, and we can do this by, uh, in, in, sense, in some sense, generalizing this mean field idea. So in the previous mean field idea, the self-consistent object was just a single electron, the behavior of a single electron, and it lived in the potential, and the potential depends on a single electron. Um, but a more general self-consistent structure is to think of your material as made of not just, just individual electrons, but of chunks of stuff. For example, unit cells or multiple unit cells. And these unit cells, in, they're all the same, right? So in some sense, if you solve for the structure of one, the electronic structure of one unit cell, it should, it should sort of update all the other unit cells around it. Okay? So you can think of a crystal as, some, as chunks of stuff embedded self-consistently in other chunks of stuff which depend on the chunk of stuff you're solving. Okay, so, so the picture is we take this crystal and we cut out some of it, and then it's embedded in some environment, which is just all the other unit cells. Um, the effect of this environment is that it both provides a potential on the system, but it also serves as a reservoir because if I just cut the material open, it's an open system, so it can exchange electrons, for example, with the outside. So we'll call this thing a bath. Um, and this bath, of course, depends on, it's just made of unit cells, so it depends on the unit cells, and the whole thing has some nonlinear dependence. So we refer to this self-consistent theory, this more general one, as a, as a quantum embedding, in particular as a self-consistent quantum embedding. Um, and it has a number of nice properties. And one of the nice properties you see that, although it's a type of mean field in some way, 
it's a mean field that can be made exact because clearly if you cut out large and larger chunks of stuff, it becomes the exact, exact description. Um, and the nice thing with this type of structure is that it's been known for quite some time that at least in very simple models of the cuprates, this in fact um, bypasses the no-go theorem that I just described, and it can in fact, you can in fact have superconducting solutions in the presence of purely repulsive interactions. So, so just let me then just say something a little bit about the models of, of uh, these high TC materials, in particular cuprates. So as you can imagine, these are complicated materials, and most of our understanding doesn't come from just gigantic simulations of the whole thing, but usually people work with simplified models. The way in which we think about these models as being related to the materials is as follows. So this is a very blurry image of a mercury bearing cuprate, some particular material. But the important atoms are the ones that live here, the copper and oxygen. They form a two-dimensional plane in the structure. Um, and since the superconductivity is essentially confined to these planes, one might think that one can just extract the plane. And, and so this is a simplified model. You just get rid of the other atoms. Um, and if you think of only the electronic degrees of freedom in the plane, the orbitals in the plane, then one obtains something called the three-band model of the cuprates. Um, one can further simplify this by recognizing that each unit cell here, which is a copper oxygen CuO2 unit, um, has one interesting orbital. It's got one open shell orbital. That means an orbital that's not completely filled. Um, and so one can just simplify each cell just to one orbital. Okay? And, then, and then with some additional uh, uh, simplifications where you throw away all the long-range Coulomb interactions and the long-range kinetic energy terms, uh, you obtain the so-called one-band Hubbard model. By the time you get to this point, um, the parameters are usually just regarded as empirical, and so these, these things like U and T, which are the Coulomb and kinetic terms, are just adjustable parameters. Okay. So, so early quantum embedding work was done on these models, in particular on the Hubbard model, the one-band Hubbard model, which is the simplest of the models. Um, and it really consisted of the procedure I described. So you take this Hubbard model and you cut out a unit cell, in this case we cut out a two by one, cuts out a two by two unit cell. Um, and, and in this work, which was done 20 years ago, uh, it was within a type of quantum embedding known as dynamical mean field theory, which is an acronym DMFT. And here is some, for example, one of such early papers. Um, and if one looks in this paper here, and one looks at the, some of the figures, this is what you see. So at the top here is an experiment, a kind of experimental picture where of a phase diagram on the y-axis is temperature, x-axis is doping, it's the same as I showed before. You see there's an antiferromagnetic phase and a superconducting phase. At the bottom is a theoretical calculation using this type of theory. On the y-axis is not the temperature, the y-axis is the so-called order parameter. It's a sort of how strong the magnetism is or how strong the superconductivity is. You might think it's correlated with the temperature, at least. Um, and it looks quite suggestive. So you have this antiferromagnetic order and this superconducting order here in this purely repulsive model. So that's all very nice. It's all really very suggestive. Um, but, you know, these results are also controversial at the same time because, for one thing, you know, this is far from the exact mean field-like description because you're just cutting out a very small cluster. Um, and if one's talking about the real material, then of course this is just a model. So the, this, this gigantic reduction, model reduction, so to speak, to the Hubbard model, well, you know, we might have lost something in the process. Okay. So it turns out that for a variety of technical reasons, these limitations are not that easy uh, to remove uh, in dynamical mean field theory. So, so when we um, started working on this problem about a decade or more ago, the first thing that we uh, tried to do was try to think of a, some quantum embedding formalism where it was easier to, for example, embed larger clusters and easier to go beyond the Hubbard model. Okay, so, so, that, so the, the simplest thing then was to just create another theory and another theory called DMET, and it clearly has some uh, alphabetical resemblance to DMFT. Um, but at a very high level, DMFT is, is a quantum embedding theory which is formulated in terms of time-dependent quantities. So if you're familiar with Green's functions, it's formulated in terms of Green's functions. So the idea is that the, what it, the, the quantity that's embedded self-consistently is the Green's function of the cluster. Um, and, you know, that's all fine. 
Um, but the issue is that the actual ultimate many electron problem you have to solve is for the equilibrium Green's function. Now, now it's a Green's function of the equilibrium thing. It's a linear response of the equilibrium thing, but nonetheless, there's still a time variable. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit numerically heavy. Um, but of course, if one's interested just in the superconductivity, that's, that's actually a time-independent equilibrium property, and perhaps this machinery is a little bit overkill. And so for that reason, we formulated a slightly simpler type of self-consistent quantum embedding called density matrix embedding theory. And there, it's just formulated in a time-independent way. The self-consistency is done on the density matrix, the single particle density matrix. And then the advantage is that now the many electron problem is just a time-independent problem. And there's a very rich set of numerical tools one can apply. OK, so this allows you to more easily go to larger clusters. And as I'll show later, it's easier to extend this to ab initio theories. OK, so the strategy then, after developing this tool, is really uh, armed with this tool and then really a lot of optimism, because these are very intractable problems. Uh, then we can ask, you know, can we actually make progress and understand the physics of these things? So, so the way that in my group the work has divided up is in the earlier years uh, of the last decade, we primarily worked on the model. So we tried to resolve some of the physics of the Hubbard model. Uh, and in more recent years, we've tried to do these things for the ab initio. Okay, so I'll first say just a little bit about the model results, and then I'll talk about the ab initio results. Okay, so the Hubbard model. So the Hubbard model is a you know, famous model because it's the simplest, in some ways, the simplest model which captures the features of correlated electron materials. And it's also famous because it's very difficult to, uh, to do things precisely. Um, it's very, very simple. So all that you have in the physics is that the electrons hop around with some energy ET, uh, and they have a Coulomb interaction when they sit on the same site, and that energy is called U. Um, and historically, people have been working on this for a long time, uh, and, and consensus has at least historically been quite elusive. So for example, if I just restrict myself to the zero temperature part of the phase diagram, um, where we study everything as a function of doping, then at no doping, we call that the half field point of the model. And there it's known that uh, it's a problem that can be solved essentially exactly by quantum Carlo, and it's known that the system is an antiferromagnet. But as you move away from this half field point, as you dope it, uh, it, you can see very many different things depending on what numerical approximations you make. And certainly if you go back, say, 10 years or, or even further, further before, then many different methods will produce many different predictions. So you can see all these different types of phenomena uh, from these older calculations uh, in the dope regime. The reason why you see so many different things is because in this model, the, the, there are many competing states. And the energy scale of, computation, of, of competition is very small. So if you make a particular numerical approximation, you will bias yourself, perhaps, to one state uh, versus another. So achieving a high accuracy uh, is essential. Sorry, I have a question. What are yes. the stripes you're referring to? Uh, well, uh, they are in inhomogeneous order in the spin and the charge degrees of freedom. And uh, I'll show a picture of it later. But uh, yeah, they are. You can think of them as spin wave and the charge wave with some relationship between the wavelengths. Yeah. Follow up question yeah. is that when you say no superconductivity or no stripe, just means that the corresponding state has an energy that's slightly lower than some of the states with the superconductivity or with the stripes. Um, it depends on the calculations. In some uh, studies, for example, you might be able to identify some metastable state that's slightly higher in energy. And in other of those studies, you just, they just focus on the ground state and they don't see anything. For example, in this one here, uh, you know, you did, there wasn't a superconducting state nearby that they characterized. They just looked at the property of the lowest of the state they found. Yeah. Um, OK. So you'll notice these are now you know, not so recent references. And, and the fact is that in the last decade or so, however, you know, improvements in algorithms and in implementations and so on and so forth have meant, however, that the situation is beginning to change. And in fact, the accuracy that one requires to resolve the differences between states is become, becoming possible to achieve with different methods. Um, so an example of this is, uh, it, oh, OK, so, so I would say that today we can reliably achieve, by a variety of different techniques, an accuracy of, of better than 1% across uh, the, the doped regions of the phase diagram. And, and, and this is not sufficient to resolve everything, but it's sufficient to resolve um, 
a number of things. Okay. So, so this is some, uh, some benchmark from, uh, from a number of different groups are using a variety of different methods. It's not really important what the methods are, but, but what you see here is that if you look at this half-filled point where you actually know the exact answer, then the spread is very, very small, right, in the NGs, the accuracy is 0.1%. And if you go into this dope regime, this happens to be the one-eighth dope regime, uh, then the spread is also not very large, okay? So, so the half width of the spread is half percent, depending on how you measure it, it's accurate, it's accurate to half a percent or one percent. And this is, not, this is enough now to say something about the actual ground state of the model. Okay, so, so, one, of the, uh, so one of the works that we, uh, uh, that we worked on together with other groups was to understand the physics of the underdoped region. Um, and what do I mean by underdoped? And this is related to the pseudo-gap question a little bit. Uh, okay, so, so at zero temperature, um, as I mentioned, you start off in a magnetic state and you dope it and eventually you become a superconducting state, but there's something in between which is not, and it's not quite clear what's happening in between. Okay? And at zero temperature, um, we, we will call this the underdoped, uh, underdoped state, the underdoped ground state. Um, now, you might think that, and it's plausible to assume, that you might learn something about the superconductivity by understanding what happens just before it becomes superconducting. Right? Perhaps you're in some precursor state to the superconductivity. And indeed, if you take real materials and you look in this underdoped region, there's a variety of unusual phenomena. Uh, for example, you have all sorts of weird patterns. These are not the atoms you're seeing here. These are, this is just sort of electronic modulations um, that you can detect in this case by STM. Um, and you can also see various you know, peaks in, the, in RICs and neutron scattering from these modulations. And you know, it's not really clear whether this really is, you know, is this good? Is this generating the superconductivity? Is this preventing the superconductivity? It's all kind of unclear, but, but something that be it started to become possible to do, and which we uh, uh, tried to work on, was whether or not we could understand this, at least within the 2D Hubbard model. And so, you know, one of the nice results then, which was from these various authors here, okay, uh, is that, um, that at least at this 1-8 doping point, it was possible then to establish with high confidence what the ground state really is. Um, and in this underdoped region, we see that the ground state is this kind of stripe. And a stripe is a funny state where you imagine that you're injecting the charges in, but the charges don't distribute themselves uniformly like you might imagine. It's a uniform lattice, but spontaneously they crystallize out into a one-dimensional order, essentially due to some, some competition between kinetic energy of these things, these charges which like to move around, and the Coulomb repulsion. And so, so they crystallize into this one-dimensional charge order and then these arrows here represent the magnetic moments, and, and these also have some modulation as well, superimposed. Okay, so that's the stripe state. Okay. All right. So, um, so now that one is able to uh, study some of the physics of the Hubbard model and not be in so much uncertainty about what's happening in the ground state, we can now start to ask the question, you know, does the Hubbard model actually reflect the physics that we wanted to capture in the beginning, which is the physics of high temperature superconductors? And one of the things that you see is that in the underdoped region, the stripe that you find is that has this type of fluctuation, has this kind of mod modulation. It has a given wavelength. It's a wavelength eight. It's what people in the field call a filled stripe. Um, but actually, in the real materials, if you look at the same doping, the wavelength's quite, quite different. It's, it's a half the wavelength, and you get a, a, um, a meta so what's called a metallic stripe, a half filled stripe. So this is you know, a, a quantitative difference. And if one goes further into the superconducting region, um, there are perhaps even more differences between the models um, and the real material. So, uh, so a variety of studies, so this is, for example, our study, and, and this is another study here, but by some other method, suggests that where you see superconductiv superconductivity is at quite strong doping, um, but more detailed numerics, this is from, from Steve and, and Shiwei, uh, in fact, argues that if you go to the doping, which is the relevant doping for the real material, you don't actually see any superconductivity. Um, and so that tells you that although the Hubbard model in some ways is, you know, captures much of the physics in some qualitative sense, uh, it also has uh, real limitations. And, and, it, and certainly, you know, if the motivation is to try and understand, as, you know, from my perspective, why given materials behave a certain way, it does seem that the Hubbard model does not have <coughs> to distinguish between 
different materials if it's already got these problems. So, uh, so that brings me to this second part, uh, which very, uh, sounds like I'm going to talk forever, just to, to another part of the talk, I should say, um, where we try and just model the height and recuperates without models. And we're going to use the same strategy. So we're going to, you know, why I showed earlier was we, we had this simple lattice problem and I cut a piece out and I embedded it. And we're just going to extend this now to the ab initio simulation, right? So now you just have the real material and you're going to cut a piece out and you're going to solve this problem self-consistently with a representation of the environment within this formalism. So conceptually, that's all it is. Uh, technically, there's a lot of detail. Okay, there's a lot of technology to be built, so it took some time. And so first we had to write a new quantum chemistry package so that this be was more natural to do, okay, which is called PyCF. Uh, and then we had to build an embedding machinery on top of it, which is described in this paper here. Um, but that work is no, now all complete, and so now we can apply this machinery to study the cuprates uh, ab initio. So, uh, so this is one of the first studies that we did. And, and in this first study, I wanted to understand some of the systematics of the parent state of the cuprate. So this is the materials before you dope them. Um, so we're going to be working here in the parent state. And what I mean by systematics is that if you, find, if you look at the different cuprate compounds, you, you'll find they have different transition temperatures, they have different mag magnetic order strengths, and so on and so forth. Um, but, but there are some trends. And, and one of the most famous trends is the so-called layer effect. And it refers to the following, which is that if you, these materials are layered materials, so this is um, a single layer cuprate, it refers to the fact that there's a cuprate plane and then lots of junk, buffer atoms, before you get to the next cuprate plane, so it's as if this is an isolated layer. Um, and this is a two-layer compound, in other words, you have two layers in close proximity before you have lots of spacers and buffers before the next one, and so on and so forth, and you can make these infinite layer compounds. And and what you see from experimental measurements is that as you increase the number of layers in the material, both the superconducting transition temperature and the magnetic order uh, increases. Okay, so if you looked at the dope state, the transition temperatures increase. Okay, this one, cannot, you cannot dope it, so we don't know the transition temperature, but it goes up from one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Um, and if you look at the magnetic order parameters, it also increases this way. Okay, so so the question is, you know, can we now begin to capture this uh, through an ab initio calculation? And since I'm going to only be working on the parent state in today's talk, I'm just going to be talking about this magnetic order increasing rather than the superconducting order today. Okay, so I will say that although this layer effect has been around for a very long time, it's never been produced by direct computation, and we don't microscopically know where it comes from. So, you know, if you do a density functional calculation, you do not get this trend. I mean, either you see they're the same, or they go down, Sometimes they go up a little bit, depending on the functional, certainly not, but not in the scale that they go up in experiments and so on and so forth. Okay. All right, so, you know, this is not really an audience where we just want to talk about all the details. So I'll just say that you can just do this. You run this machinery, um, and you can calculate, for example, the energies of different magnetic configurations within this embedding theory or ab initio, and then from that you can extract the exchange. Um, and then you do in, see, in fact see that you see the, the layer effect appear. Okay, so here you have these different compounds, mercury, calcium. These, these, you just increase the number of layers. This is the strength of the magnetic coupling, which determines the magnetic order. And you see that it just increases. Um, and it increases in what is essentially a quantitatively correct way. So um, from these exchange couplings, we can derive the spin wave spectra. And so here I compare the um, spin wave spectra extracted from Rick's experiments, and you can compare it to the spin waves from, it's really hard to see, but from, from theory, um, and essentially they show the same trends. Okay, so now that we're able to reproduce the material properties in silica, right, in the computer, then you can start to ask the question, where does this trend actually come from? Where's the microscopic, what's the microscopic origin? And, uh, so we know that the antiferromagnetic order increases as, the sort of, as you go from one layer to multiple layers. Um, and so if you start to look at the correlated electronic structure, in particular the correlated band structure, an important difference between the single layer compound and these infinite layer compound is the fact that close to the Fermi level, there are some additional empty orbitals involving this, these junk atoms, these buffer atoms, the mercury and oxygen atoms. Okay? They are atoms that sit 
away from the copper oxygen plane, so they sit above the copper oxygen plane, but they're actually they're very close to the Fermi level. So presumably, they should be doing something. Um, and so what one can then try to do in the calculation is to turn these orbitals on and off because you have an, you complete control over all the electronic processes. And you know that the magnetic super exchange arises from excitations of the ele of electrons between magnetic ions, the copper ions, and, and the sort of the non-magnetic atoms, right? It's a typical pathway. And presumably, these, these other atoms, you know, mercury, these non-magnetic things, um, are participating somehow in the super exchange and giving this layer effect. So one can take these compounds here and turn off all these outer plane orbitals. So if you're an electronic structure person, you just turn off all the excitations there um, and see what happens. Um, and you find that, in fact, once you turn these off, these specific orbitals off, then the exchange couplings in all the compounds becomes the same. Okay, so they start off very different, and then they become basically the same. Okay, so so that, that tells you that it's, in fact, these, this specific set of orbitals which are doing doing the job, and, and the more detailed analysis basically shows you that there's a competition between these, exchange, these excitations that's going out of plane and in the plane, which generate the normal super exchange, and this is essentially what gives rise to this trend. So as a summary of this ab initio part of the talk, I'll just say, you know, this shows that you can in fact perform quantitative quantum chemistry, and we can reproduce things like the layer effect of magnetism and understand the microscopic mechanism, and there's nothing in this procedure which prevents us from studying the, the dope phases and superconducting phases. And in fact, this is, a, this is what we're doing right now. OK, so I'll just finish with a couple of slides on what this workshop is really about. Yes, go on. Yeah. Well, maybe this ties into what, what you're getting to. OK. But um, in terms of, say, these uh, out of plane extra yes. orbitals, then you might think of integrating them out into further poppings or exchange. Yes. And, um, you know. They give rise to presumably some longer range terms, um, as, as, as you know, as, since you know much more about this than everyone else. I mean, they give rise to larger ring exchange um, and, and longer range hoppings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, that, so that there's, of course, the question of whether we should be integrating them out or not. And that's really kind of the, this is what this is about. Yeah. OK. So. OK, so you know, I started the talk by kind of proceeding in one direction, right? So I went from models, the Hubbard model. In fact, you could start even earlier. You could start with simpler models than the Hubbard model. I started with the Hubbard model, moved towards ab initio as if that's the end goal, right? But that might not be the end goal, right? OK, so you can say, when should we use models? Um, so you know, I've just been going in this direction. I've, sorry, I've been going in this direction. But you might want to go in this direction. Right? And, um, and it's clear that if you want to access the long wavelength physics, for example, the stripe stuff, right? I mean, each of these lattice points here is an entire unit cell to study, you know, very long wavelength. And this is actually only half the stripe. So if you were to study a very long wavelength phenomenon, it's probably going to be impossible to do it without some reduction into a model. Um, but, there, but there's a question of, on the other hand, you know, should you be using models for anything other than the quality of long wavelength physics? Um, and I would say that the approach that I presented in this talk, where you just deal with all the degrees of freedom at the same time, is not actually the, the way usually people like to do this. Okay? People don't think about it in this way usually. Usually, if one does embedding, um, you really take out a very, very small number of degrees of freedom and then try and construct a type of model on steroids which somehow integrates out everything very, very accurately. And then you try and use this as an approach to reach high accuracy. Okay, so, so the standard picture is that you start with many, many bands, for example, and you just downfold them into a very small number. Um, and then you have some very complicated interactions which, if you work in a Green's function language, are retarded, so they have this very strong frequency dependence, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, so I say this is actually much more common. This is the way in which most people are developing things. Um, but I would just argue that maybe this is not the right way. Okay. So because it's very challenging to downfold everything to a very small number of degrees of freedom while retaining all the accuracy that you want. So if you want to study qualitative physics, well, okay, you can throw away some stuff. But if you want to retain quantitative chemical accuracy, I think this is very hard. Okay. And, and these models themselves, although they look simple, 
there's a lot hidden in them. So you have these complicated interactions. That in the, they might have very strong time dependence, so they have very, very complicated peaks in them, and that's what's containing, in fact, the material-specific behavior. So it may not be easier to work with them than working with a full thing. So, you know, so this is just my opinion, but I, I, it's been my hypothesis that there's not a lot of savings, often by eliminating the bands, for the task of reaching high accuracy, at least. And sometimes you get a worse problem by eliminating the bands. But that begs the question, however, and I don't have a real answer to this, why, why these calculations which start with all the degrees of freedom actually work to describe low energy physics in the first place? Um, because from a back of the envelope perspective, you know, we're working from an energy scale that starts, that's very large. Okay? Um, in fact, if you think about the core electrons, then you have you know, 1,000 EV, you can have very, very large energy scales. The magnetism is at some scale which is much, much smaller, you know, 0.1 EV or less. And the superconducting energy scale is even smaller. And so if you ask, well, how do I go from this sort of large number to the small number and not make some error that just overwhelms everything, it's actually a little bit mysterious. Um, and I don't have a good answer for why things actually work. Um, but this is some guess, okay? So how are we able to treat these small energies starting from ab initio calculations? And I think the reason why things work is because the small energy scales don't arise as a difference of large numbers. They rise as the ratio of large numbers. So, um, so for example, the exchange energy you know, is kind of in these units, roughly, right? So it's, it's an, in units of large numbers divided by large numbers. And you can make sort of small errors even in the denominator here. But it's a large number. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Um, and then secondly, when we construct our theory, you know, uh, we usually actually have the processes which generate these ratios explicitly in the calculation. I see, is that, is that Nadine? Hello, Nadine was an undergraduate in my class. Really nice to see you. Um, so, uh, uh, so for example, this is a perturbation theory expression. And so if you do an ab initio calculation with perturbation theory, then you're actually putting the formula into your computational graph. So if your computational graph has these functions, which is generating these small things as these ratio of these numbers, then probably you're OK. Then probably you're safe. Okay? Um, but I don't actually know. I mean, sometimes people who are very skeptical of this approach just say, well, how can you get anything meaningful? Okay? But uh, this is my guess. And that's a question that I'm going to end with. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you. <laughs>